Hey, you down here? <clears throat> okay, um, just wanted to make a little quick video just to kind of get down an idea I had, kind of a funny idea. Um, <clears throat> I was watching a video uh, not too a while ago where uh, by the guy, uh, a channel is called Don DIY. Now, I'm Don, but this guy's Don D O N N. He's, uh, I'm in America, he's over, some overseas uh, uh, for us. I uh, can't remember what country, I, I did, it's kind of somewhere around Switzerland, Denmark, I think, area, you know. Uh, but anyway, uh, he builds a lot of really cool stuff. He's really good at fabricating stuff. Uh, he built an amphibious ATV, now he's building a 4x4 ATV, and he's using, uh, for the suspension, he's using, uh, I forgot the brand of cars. We don't really have, it. I don't know if we've ever, I, I've heard of one, being, you know, having them over here, but it's small cars, lightweight cars, and he's using the uh, A-arms and a motor out of one. He's got, he'll buy cars and stuff for parts, you know, he'll just strip them down. He, he, he's got a motor he's gonna use, uh, and he's actually combining parts. And now I'm going into his video. Anyway, it's pretty cool. If, you want to watch that but uh, the thing the, the video that I was watching which I've always been interested in doing he's really good at figuring out ways to do things that generally would you would think you would have to have a lathe or a mill or both uh, you know machine shop tools to do these things and he figures out ways to do it with uh, he does have a see does he have a mill lathe now He's got quite a bit of tools now, but uh, years ago when I first saw his channel, uh, he narrowed a rear, was, that was the first thing I was really interested in. He narrowed a rear end with with a welder and an angle grinder, basically, you know, he didn't have any lathe or anything. And uh, he he used it on a, on a mower he made that was like, he used a differential out of some small car, I think, or maybe a small truck. Uh, to he didn't use it like a regular differential, you know, with a differential in the middle, r rear end, what you might a lot of people call them. Uh, he with the he didn't have the wheels on the other side. He turned inverted it, and he attached a drive to it, and it turned his mower blade. Uh, I can't remember. It was been so long since I saw it. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it was a mower. I can't remember if it was one you put in. He had, I think he might have built two of them, one, one or, or three or four. He built, he was dragging one behind a, not a tractor. He was dragging like, you know, most people do, especially over here in, well, in Texas where I live. I, that's the most common thing you'll see is a, a brush hog behind a, a tractor, you know, or maybe they'll use a, a lot of days, a lot of times nowadays I see on the internet they're using, uh, they're using, uh, Kubotas, you know, do whatever brand it might be, small, you know, and usually they have a bucket on them, and they're, they're, you can put different attachments on them, and so they've got, you can actually buy them that, that you're pushing it, you know, and they work, pre I've watched some videos on them because it's pretty interesting, but they work really pretty well, but they, you know, when you go up and down like that, well, the mower goes up and down like that, so that's not really ideal. Sometimes it'll go too high, sometimes the back of it will hit the ground or the front, you know, uh, and the thing about like the the old, well, it depends on, well, the old regular bush hogs, brush hogs, bush hogs, that's what we always call them. Uh, they usually have one or two wheels in the back of it. And so when you, when you sit, when you set it down, you have it all set up right when you set it down, it's pretty well level from front to back of the mower deck. And the wheel keeps it from digging in like that. And well, you know, if it's real uneven terrain or if the wheel hits a hole or something, it'll, it'll, it'll hit the ground. But. Uh, anyway, he had. Uh, I think the dry. I think the whole thing was that he had a. He had one where um, it had wheels on it, and as the wheels turned, it turned the mower blade. And he's using. I think that differential I'm thinking of is what he used that for to. You know, as the rotation of the wheels on the thing went through the differential to change the raise up the speed of the blade enough to be a good. You know, a good mower. And I think he built another one to put on front of a SUV or not SUV, ATV or a, or a tractor, or whatever. Well, ATV, the the ATVs he had, just a regular. He he had one or two regular ATVs. He built things for. He did things like 
I think he put tracks on one to make it go. It snows a lot there in the winter where he lives and where he could go in the snow and stuff. But anyway, now he's building a four by four. Uh, he's got he's already he's he's starting. Well, he's got the tire he's got the tires that he wants. They're just big old tractor tires looking things, you know. Uh, he called them ATV tires, but they, you, if if you've seen you know the back tires on a track, most tractors, then uh, that's what they look like. But they're actually I think he said how big tall they are. I think they're like 32 inches or 34 inch tall tires, good size, especially for an ATV. Um, so um, looks like it's going to be cool. But uh, the wheels he had that the, the fits his hubs that he's using. He's mixing things like his differentials are from BMW, his hubs and uh, A-arms and uh, I don't know if they call them A-arms. That's what they call the American, you know, the ones I'm used to, like in Chevys and Fords and stuff. Well, Chevys, I don't even really know. Uh, there's a lot of different types of suspensions in Fords, you know, especially Ford trucks. But um, and these are small cars. I don't know. I've never worked on these little real things. I've only ever worked on from 19 uh, had a 54 Chevy. I started out in 60s, 70s cars, and you know, uh, uh, well, I had well, I had a 64 panel Chevy panel truck, 70 SF Chevelle. I got right now. I got a 76 Chevy Blazer 4x4 and an 83 Dodge van. And over the years, I had you know, I, ha I used to have a 54 Chevy Bel Air. <clears throat> so that's the kind of things I'm, I know how to work on. <clears throat> so um, anyway. Um, his wheels were something like five inches wide, and uh, and uh, but that's what fits his hubs. He's going to use you know his hubs and his brakes and everything, and uh, but his tires are. I think he said they were. They might no. I don't think they're quite ten inches. I think they're about eight inches wide. Mine are, my wheels on my Blazer. This is, uh, are ten inches wide, and that's what my. Well, I, when I first bought, I, ever so, I always used to run 35 inch tire, 35 inch tall by uh, 12 and a half wide, and on 10 inch wheels. And you need at least 10 inch wheels for that wide of a tire. And the ones I have now are only like 33s, I think. <clears throat> I got them used because I couldn't afford to buy new ones at the time. And uh, but they they're still wide. I think they're the same width. I think they're 12 and a half. They might be 11 and a half. So anyway. Um, I uh, had really, okay, so he needed, uh, going in circles, he needs his wheels to be wide enough for his tires. So he made him up a jig to where he could, uh, he could spin that wheel in it and, and angle, and, and, and I, I arm on it to hold his big, big angle. He's got a lot, he's an angle, angle grinder guy. I mean, he, he, had, he knows how to use, he's really good with them. And he has a book, seems like he has, well, I don't know if he has a bunch of them, but I know I've seen him use. I mean, he's probably got four or five of them at least. But he has one really big one, <clears throat> and he uh, he rigged it up so that the wheels can turn and the angle grinder can come down on it. It's just really beautiful, just simplicity, yet ac you know, but but in ingenuity with simplicity and accuracy. So, and, and, you, and when you said, I, and I, I said, I wonder if he'll just, let the anger grinder turn the wheel as it as it cuts, and that's exactly what he did. And then when he wanted to, he could slow it down or speed it up by just grabbing the wheel with his hand. So he just kept working around it until he cut it perfectly straight. Because you know, and that, of course, it's it's not as as uh, critical as well. Even my blazer, you know. I mean, I'm going if I'm going down the highway at 60 to. I don't really. I, I never hardly ever drove it very fast, but. Uh, um, because it doesn't handle good it fast, you know, big old tires on it and everything. But, uh, uh, you know, generally running between 45 and 60. On, and that would be, if anything was off, you know, your wheel's going to wobble and might break, you know, or or be dangerous, hard to handle. <coughs> but on an SUV, ATV, that uh, basically he's building his own four-wheeler, you know, <coughs> Uh, but it'll be a little. I think it's it's going to be bigger than a regular four wheeler. I believe it, it's kind of going to look like a monster four wheeler. Right? It just looks to me like. But 
Um, I was interested in that because I always thought, well, you know, if you're going to, people always, pe people build things like that. Uh, I mean, mostly they build sort of like doom buggies kind of things, but, well, they, usually they'll take parts off a four-wheeler and rebuild it with a, their own frame or something and make it bigger or smaller or whatever they want to do. But I always thought, well, you know, the one, the one thing... And a lot of people like to put really big tires on them and everything. I was like, well, now that's going to break pretty easy, you know, because uh, those, uh, they're, they're really good design, it looks like. They're really, uh, but, uh, you know, if you're stressing them, stressing that, those eight, those small A-frames, tube, tubing A-frames and everything, you know, well, I've seen, seen them breaking them, you know, messing around with them, riding them and everything. They break them and fix them, break them and fix them. But what he's got is enough to handle, you know, the, the parts he's got come off of small cars, uh, that uh, are made to be probably three or four times the weight of what his ATV will be. So that would, should be just right. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, anyway, he when he cut that wheel, he cut it, and he also, he cut it, well, I couldn't really, okay, here's the, the inside of the, well, okay, here's the inside of the wheel. He cut it right in the right place so that it, uh, when he got it off of there, it was just round, you know. It's really hard to explain. But um, he, uh, I'm going on and on about what he did. But um, anyway, he, <clears throat> he, and he, then he got him a piece of band of metal about, I think he said he needed two inches more to make it how wide he needed it. And he, been, he has a, a metal roller that he made, a metal bender that he made himself. <laughs> Looks like an old an old laundry clothes roller from back in, uh, well, my uh, my great aunt and uncle I ran a laundry mat and they had one <laughs> up until I was probably, when they finally got too old to run it, I think I was 45 years old or something, you know. Uh, but uh, it was made, you know, well, I don't, this was sort of a heavy duty one. They had one, they had two, I think they had two out in the laundry for people to use. I used to go, my grand, my grandma, mama and papa, on my, my grandma and grandpa on my dad's side, they used to always just go to the worst of clothes uh, until they got older and they got tired, you know, it was a little too much for them. And then I installed them a washer and dryer and they had four bedrooms and I put it in one of their, she wanted, my grandma wanted, my mama wanted it in one of their bedrooms and I put it in there. But I used to go with them sometimes when I was a kid. Um, they like to use those rollers to wring their clothes out more before they'd put them in the dryer. And they had a whole system. She'd be dragging them out of the washer and Papa would be wringing them out. And they always say, keep away from that thing. It'll break you. It'll roll your fingers in it, you know. And they could, do. <laughs> anyway, you may have seen them. There. It's now that, you know, antique and, and retro things are popular. Uh, I'll see them. Sometimes people get one and get an old washer that has one of those built in and fix it up, you know, and stuff. And, so anyway, uh, that's what the thing looks like, and I kind of kind of noticed that today. I never had really thought of it before, but the angle he was showing, I thought, man, that just looks just like an old. It's not. I mean, I think he just made it from part, you know, scrap. He he makes he usually uses as much scrap as he can to save money, scrap metal and stuff. But um, anyway, he. Um, he welded that two-inch piece on there, and then he put his piece he'd cut off back on that, and then got him his wide wheel, and then I think maybe he might have uh, had an after. Well, I didn't realize it at the time because he went and he tried. He stuck his wheel on that uh, axle assembly. He was working on that and checking the clearance, and he realized, uh oh, I don't have enough clearance. You know, the wheel now is going to hit the uh, the uh, springs spring assembly, I can't remember what you call it thing. I, I remembered it when I was watching the video because it kept saying that word, but it's common in all these small cars. And it, I don't, it, you know, even if they're, I've, you see them in all the smaller, not necessarily, they don't have to be compact, just anything smaller than a, than an old big Chevy, you know, or something. Uh, strut, it's a strut. So the, the strut has a, it, it's like a shock inside of a spring, is what it looks like to me. And uh, so he put smaller springs on it because he didn't want that heavy duty of a spring off of an even lighter weight car, he said. And still, it, and that, and, but it, when he got it all to that point and he mocked it up, it was going to, we said the wheel was going to hit. So he, he, he went back and he, I think this was, 
sort of, uh, I think he could have planned for that if he would, when he was splitting the wheel and widening it, he could have done it a little, on the other side maybe, I'm not quite sure, and not had that happen. But anyway, the offset of the wheel was such that it was, you know, the wheel was hitting that strut back here. And so he cut the whole center out, which I was like, my gosh, he's, is he going to be able to get that out and get it back in there straight enough for the wheel to not go like this, you know? But uh, he uh, he doesn't hardly talk much at all. I think he doesn't know a whole lot of English is the thing. Uh, either that or he just doesn't like to stop and talk while he's working. I really don't know. But he, he always does subtitles. But once in a while he'll say something. He does, I mean, he does, he, he has, he has a, you know, a pretty good accent, so... Sometimes I have to go back, you know, listen to it again three or four times. I don't know what he just said, but anyway, he kind of popped up. He'll pop up in his in his titles that he puts in there. They're built into the video, you know, not like uh, subtitles that you can turn on and off. And um, anyway, he said he made sort of a joke about it. So, uh, oh, about it, it'll be good enough for me, my, my purposes, you know, about wobbling. Uh, and uh, so anyway, when he if. Whether he could have avoided that by, uh, you know, uh, cutting that wheel in a different place or not, I don't know. He didn't say anything one way or the other, and I, I was just watching his workmanship, not so much his plan. Uh, he always, he always does. He, his plans are usually really good, and if he does run into a problem, then he'll sometimes just say, "Oh, well, I missed that. It didn't work right. And I got to do it again." You know, he didn't say that, so I don't know. But anyway, if if it was a mistake. That he could have avoided that, or if it just was going to be that way. Anyway, anyway, he cut that center out. Very, he got on the back side very carefully, cut the welds. They all welded together. Wheel, these kind of wheels. I mean, a lot of wheels are that way. And then he flipped or flipped the uh, the center part around and put I mean, put it on the other side of the wheel. I yeah, put it on the other. Anyway, I'm not exactly sure where. <laughs> he, I think he took it off of this side, flipped it, and put it on the other side. Anyway, it got his offset the way it needed enough to give him some clearance indigestion. Um, but to give him some cl enough clearance so his heel's not heel's not going to be hitting it, and his tires not going to be hitting that big old mud tires that he's putting on there not going to be hitting the, uh, <coughs> the struts. So after, after, as a, and one of, one of the reasons I was really interested in being wondering, I've been wondering if it would be possible to do that without uh, having a lathe, you know, and all that. When I was young, my first, my very first job was in a machine shop. I ran, I learned to run a lathe and a screw, what they called a screw machine. Drilled hundreds and hundreds of holes on the drill press for. An, for stick shifts for the army jeeps back in 1973 or so when i was when i got that job and over the years well i did i was a cabinet maker i was a tool maker and ran we had a lathe in a, in a bridgeport mill in our shop at general dynamics we built f-16s and i was a tool maker in that shop and anyway i've done different things i always like always used to work with my hands <clears throat> and uh and I, I have, I still have, you know, a good set of hand tools, and I have a welder and stuff. And I'm not very good at welding. I'm, I always say I'm a, I'm a dauber, not a welder. But um, there's actually more technical things you need to learn about welding to be good at it. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, I have, well, I have two. Actually, have two welders. I, back in 1975, I believe it was, I bought a 110 volt Sears arc welder and I did welding with it over the years but it was so hard to weld with because it was so underpowered it was only a 70 amp and it was an AC arc welder I found out as I got older that DC arc welders are a lot easier to weld with and especially when they have more power but uh, oh probably might have been 10 years ago now I bought a, a wire welder uh, let's see I always have trouble remembering which you know TIG and MIG but yeah TIG Oh, now I've forgotten again. You know, I, mine, I do not use gas, but I could. I, there, you can, it has the, everything in there that you could buy a gas bottle and put it on there. It has a little kit to hook it up with and everything that came with it. But I've never used gas because <clears throat> uh, what I needed to do, I didn't really need it. 
that I replaced the floorboards. Well, I replaced the driver's side with that 110 volt, and that was just a horrendous job. But I did finally get it done with bad welds, you know, really bad welds. And then uh, when I went ahead, when I went to do the other side, I bought that welder because I found one on sale for $175 and brand new. <clears throat> and uh, that was a heck of a lot easier. And uh, and it's a DC as well, but uh, <clears throat> uh, I mean, it, you plug it in the it's a, you can it runs on 110 volt AC, but it, it's a DC output, you know. So anyway, I think from what I see, I watch lots of how you know project videos and how to videos these days. From what I gather, I think mine's a DC. I'd have to get it out and look at it, and it's, you know, buried under a bunch of stuff. It's behind a lot of stuff in the garage, so it'd be hard to do. But uh, <coughs> anyway, I, for years, actually it's not such a good idea now, I don't think, but for years, uh, you know, talking about, t um, when I, you know, the government auctions, if you've ever seen the government auctions, uh, they were selling, uh, they still sell them, but they people bid too much on them now. It's not really worth it. But you, I was seeing like sets of five to eight, 45, 45, 48 inch mud tires off those, uh, off of those, uh, you know, military vehicles, like the M5As and stuff, uh, the six by six vehicles or the stuff like that. Um, I was seeing them go for with the wheels for uh you know three hundred fifty dollars about four fifty five hundred fifty dollars now there are people paying up to like two thousand or more for that same amount of wheels you know and that's just not worth it because they're used and and uh but anyway uh i kept thinking all over the years i kept thinking of course, those wheels wouldn't fit my my '76 Chevy Blazer is a six lug Chevy boat pattern, uh, half ton. It's a half ton, and those those are made for. Eh, well, it depends on the you know the the wheel model and all that. But the trucks are anywhere from two. They call them deuce and a half, two and a half tons to five ton vehicles, and uh, <clears throat> so I kept thinking. But uh, but when it you know when you're looking at. Um, it's a twelve hundred bucks still. It always has been around twelve hundred bucks to get a new set of tires uh, for my Blazer, uh, thirty-five inch tires. <clears throat> and uh, I think I actually they have some that they had on sale and stuff last year. I didn't get them yet, but uh, um, but I, I could get five for about twelve hundred. It might have been a little more than that. But anyway, uh, I need five now. I've just all the time. I've got yeah, I've got. No, the spare's down. Uh, the spare may be on the ground now, but anyway, I've got two that are blown out. I've got the back end of it up on jack stands. Oh, one's blown out. The other one just won't hold air. It's got cracks in it. And the spare, I, I have, let's see. I can't I did have, I've got one, an extra, I had an extra tire of those used tires. One of them was the one that was the most worn was more worn than I realized after once I got them home. Uh, the one was the most worn. I didn't put it on. I just saved it as a backup. And so I was going to put it on one of the wheels. And what I was running was three matching and one unmatching tire. But it, that one that was unmatching was a BF Goodrich that was almost new when I bought it. I had bought it used all by itself. And it, so it had, and I have I don't drive very, at anything very much anymore. So it, the tread it was is fantastic on it. You know, it hardly even shows any sign of wear. But when those when those mud tires like that get seven plus or more years old, they'll end up just they'll just crack and will either blow out or just leak down. That's what one of them did. So uh, <clears throat> I've only got the front two tires the only ones that are holding air right now. I've got jack stands under the back of the truck. And I got the carburetor off because because it needed to be rebuilt, and I haven't ever been able to finish that. Uh, my I have serious ups and downs with my health, so I get something started and I can't finish it. If you know, for long, well, I haven't finished. That's been three years, I think, about now since I got that carburetor off the truck. But um, 
anyway, so it's not something I can really do, uh, most like very very likely. But I still love learning about stuff. I just always love learning. So anyway, uh, what I was thinking about was wonder if I could. Uh, I was trying to think of ways, like if you had a mill, a lathe, a lathe and a mill. If you had a lathe, then you could make. Uh, you could easily make adapters. Uh, Wheel adapters, you know, <clears throat> they're pretty expensive to buy. I mean, one one that would take from a five a six lug Chevy to those military wheels, you know, you'd have to have them custom made. Uh, I've never I looked, you know, I couldn't find anything like that. But uh, I thought, well, I wonder if you could cut the 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 center out of those wheels. I have, they're old, they're rusty, and the inside, no, the outside's okay, not bad. Uh, old white steel wagon wheels. Good wheels and tough wheels. I mean, they were on it. They were on it when I bought it. And uh, actually, one of them did rust out. And, well, just a little hole in the middle. It quit, you know, quit, started leaking. And I got rid of it and bought a new one. But the one the one I replaced it with was offset a little difference. I didn't know, really. I don't think I noticed it until... Yeah, I didn't notice it because I just put it on the back. That's where with it. And then later, I decided to rotate the tires in that new one was hitting my steering knuckle. It was just just touching it. Just 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 barely. See the offset was different and I hadn't even realized it, you know. And uh <clears throat> you look and when just looking at it you really can't tell, you know. And uh so that wheel I ha I got rid of it cuz I didn't see any way that I could fix it way back. This was back in the 90s. I've had that truck since 92, so it was like in the sometime in the mid 90s. Uh so, uh, yeah, I didn't think, well, I actually asked a guy, I, I went, my, let's see, what was I heading, well, I, I went to, a, there was a muffler shop up close to where I used to live back then that, uh, there was a, a, a guy there that was a good welder, and, uh, he welded something up on my black, my bumper mount, uh, my bumper is gone. I, my bumper is. I had a bumper when I bought the truck. It was, was just like one of those newer bumpers somebody had put on there, and it has a trailer hitch that you can't actually get off because of the way they put it on. But it's all welded to the frame, and and it's one of those where you should be able to slide it out. And it's got a drop down that's perfect for pulling a, a normal trailer, you know, because the truck is high. You can't. It, if you had a normal trailer, it'd be like that, you know. But it, it's it's one of those drop down hitches. But uh, when you're four-wheeling, it would drag the ground a lot, and I'd bend it sometimes. So uh, <clears throat> used to four-wheel it a lot back then. And um, anyway, one time, one time I got stuck playing around on the edge of the lake. I got stuck, and, and I got found somebody come along in a big old pickup, you know, four by four pickup, and I asked him to try to pull me out. And I went in there, I went in there and hooked it up to the bumper, n not really thinking that that bumper wasn't tough enough, and and I wasn't thinking about him, you know, getting sl backing up, getting slack of the chain, giving it a yank, and he did that to try because he couldn't get me out. It wasn't coming out. He yanked the bumper smooth off of the thing. So all I have is the trailer hitch mount. Anyway, at some point there, well, the little guards for the there's like these guards that go like this for the uh, license plate to mount on, and uh, and the way that bumper was, it. Uh, it it hid the whole there was it hid the open spaces in the bumper. This is steel, like well, about three sixteenths steel, and then the other parts were like probably three eighths. They're bigger than quarter, about three eighths steel. It's solid. Never, I've pulled trailers with it and stuff. It it's real solid, but uh, um, so. I was wondering, always thought, I wonder if there, if you could, if I could, or a person could, cut that center out of my wheels that fit my truck, and then weld them into those big old, those big old army wheels. They really have really big holes in them anyway. So it would actually, if you did a good job, if you were good at welding and everything, you could actually make it look decent, even, you know. Uh, but but the thing I thought was, how could, you know, I wondered if you could really do that and not have it like an egg shape, basically. And then when you're going 70 miles an hour down the road, you're 
you already have enough trouble with those big, the regular 35-inch mud tires. And not, imagine those old military 45 and 48-inch tires would uh, really bounce. Um, but they're, I can tell they're made better because I've been washing them for years. And even the ones that are just about wore out and they've got rock rash and gashes in them and everything else, they, they're still together. They hadn't blown out, you know. So I got to thinking, well, heck, you know. Once in a while, you'll see a set of five go for four or five go for about five hundred dollars. Now it was, I didn't have the money back then anyway, so it didn't matter. But when I first started following those government auctions, uh, you know, if you got a set, of, if you got five of them or six of them or eight of them for three hundred fifty bucks, it would be worth the shipping or the trip to go get them. You know, <clears throat> um, but um, with the wheels especially. Now, you could buy wheels, you know, that would fit them, uh, but I wasn't even thinking about doing that, you know. Um, but anyway, um, after seeing the, the first part of widening the wheel, I was just I was just amazed at how simply he did a good job at doing that. Because uh, I've watched videos on how people, you know, like company, you know, companies that do things like that, a few. There's not a lot of videos on doing things like widening wheels and stuff because most people just go buy the, the width they want. Most of the time, that's the best thing to do. You know, is you get them used if you don't want to if you can't buy, don't want to buy them new. You know, but um, but in the and I was just you know I love four wheeling and big tires and all that. Ever since well I started I liked four wheeling years and years before I ever had a four-wheeler, you know. I used to four-wheel my old 64 panel truck back in, I got it in 75, and I used to drive it everywhere off the road. It, it had real, you know, a lot of weight on the back ends, and it was just a one-wheel peel, you know, differential. Uh, it was, I guess it was fairly low geared because when I got it, it had a six, straight six in it, 250s, I believe it was, six-cylinder. And I threw a rod in that thing and had to get another one up in Colorado and put it in there. And then when I come back to Texas, just you know, I uh, and uh, I, I I wanted well, I had, when I was in high school, I loved 454s. Everybody else wanted 350s, and I had three, I had a 350 put in my '64 Chevelle when I was in high school. It ran good. It's fast, but uh, I always. I, I had a 1975 motor manual uh, that had all the listings of all the factory horsepowers and of all in Chevy engines and stuff from 75. Uh, which way did it go? Yeah, 75 forward, I think. Or did it go 75 backwards? I think it might have went 75 back to 72 or something. Yeah, that's what it was. I still have it. It's in the garage. But... Uh, um, Going blank. That's why I wanted to get this down before I forgot it. So um, anyway, I knew 454s had like uh, well. Let's see. I think I think they had as much as 475 horsepower. Now this is. I, well, you know, there's brake horsepower and there's whatever the other one is. Anyway, back then they didn't use the one they changed to in the 80s, which uh, mo which I always thought was a better way to rate them. Not, not because, okay, let's see. I think brake horsepower is like, they put a brake mecha braking mechanism on, on in a dyno. They put a braking mechanism on the flywheel, and and then the other one is at the wheels. So uh, <clears throat> I don't know why I can't remember can't remember words right when I want to say them. But <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> uh, when they started changing the Right after 70, 70, 1970 was really the last year of any decent horsepower, whichever way you want to rate it. Uh, 71, 72, the, the smog laws they put in effect, they, they couldn't build engines that ran worth of crap, and they just ruined anything, you know, all the, the Z, you could buy, if you had a 72, 
I had a 70 SS Chevelle that was 350 horsepower, <coughs> but it was a, it wasn't a 4VD4. It was a, it was marked 396 on the car, but it was a 402 big block. What it was it was a 396 block and everything with longer, uh, with longer stroke. It was a stroker before. Nobody ever called it anything stroker back then, but it was what they call a stroker now. Turned out they figured out after about 20 years later, <laughs> they started figuring out, hey, that's really a good idea. And I knew it was a good idea because I had, I had one and I knew how it ran. You know, that thing was amazing. Now, now I raced the 454. I think it was the 70 as well. And I, mine was an automatic. It wasn't the, it was an SS Chevelle, but it wasn't the one with the bucket seats and everything. I guess it was the more baser model of the SS Chevelle. So it was 350 horsepower, and I think the next one was 375. And I don't remember exactly how far they went up, but I raced the 454 Cal Induction Chevelle. That was the bad one, and it, it was faster <laughs> than mine. And I beat most everything else I raced on the street. I didn't, never did get on a track or anything. Um, but um, anyway, um, stroker. Why am I talking about strokers and big blocks and all that? Okay, back to the wheels. I don't know why I was talking about that. So anyway, I just had this vision one, you know, in my, you know, how things just come to you one day of, I mean, you know, cutting those centers out of my wheels that I have and putting them into the other wheels, especially if the spokes on them were long enough that you could actually, they just fit or you cut a little off and it would fit inside that wheel. Uh, you could really actually make it look decent. I don't really could say you'd make it look like it was made that way, but you could either put the spokes where you can see where they adjoin on the wheel, or you could put them on the back side, and all you and all you would see was we would see all those holes from those wheels, those government, you know, those six by six wheels, and you could bolt it together first. I mean, you could bolt it all. You could you, there's enough holes around in there. You could bolt that center piece in there, and. Um, and then weld it too, you know. But it would definitely be safe. You can make it safe. And uh, so after seeing him cut those centers out of those wheels, of course he was lucky because they were kind of, they weren't really a press fit in there. He tapped them in with a hammer. He cut it and then cut it, tapped it out with a hammer. And then he, made, he tapped them in with a, you know, a, one of those plastic body hammer. Or what I what I used to call them, you know, pl usually the one he, I saw the one he had is plastic on one side and rubber on the other. I don't know if I still have the one I had growing up, but I had one that was like yellow plastic on both ends. I know I broke the handle a few times, but I don't know if I ever put another handle back on it or not. I got a, what they call a dead blow hammer now. It's a pl plastic hammer with sand or, or metal beads inside, you know. You can hear it kind of moving when you, but it's nice and heavy. It'll 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 move things, you know. But anyway, it's for beating on stuff you don't want to tear up. You know, it's it's plastic head on it. You know, plastic handle, plastic head. It's filled with something heavy. It's probably not sand because I think it, sand might not be. It's probably heavier than sand. It feels like it's heavier than sand. But anyway, <clears throat> um, that was just really interesting okay now here's the idea <laughs> after how long 38 minutes and 56 59 seconds uh, the idea that came to me is for some related wheels but not to all that necessarily as i was watching him work i've always you know was thinking about my i started thinking about my tires and going how they always go bad and I, right now i could buy some I could buy a brand new set of tires. I could buy new wheels. I was thinking about buying new wheels. I could buy new wheels, not, you know, cheap, cheap cheaper ones, not. I don't want to spend a bunch of money on wheels. But uh, <clears throat> um, it just hit me, something I don't really remember ever thinking of. I like to think up stuff, uh, think up ideas, how to do things. But uh, I thought, 
I've always really uh, liked, well, like back to the military, they call, you know, some of those military vehicles have what they call them run flat tires. Like I, I was really seriously considering trying to buy one of those six by sixes, but I can even work on my blazer and as big and heavy as that stuff is, I couldn't work on that. And they're diesels. I don't know anything about diesels. I have learned some. Uh, those old diesels that don't have electronics, they're pretty simple. I could learn to to maintain one of those. I wouldn't want to have to rebuild one of them or anything really. I have rebuilt, I rebuilt a one 454. Uh, let's see what, yeah, I rebuilt it. I just had, uh, I had a machine shop, Magnaflux it and everything and uh, put the rods on the pistons because I bought new pistons. I won't go off on into that, but anyway. Uh, but it did. A year, a year or so later, it spun a rod bearing, and it was because we reused those rods. I, I, they told me that those rods are kind of, kind of not in great shape. And I said, "Well, I can buy some new ones." And they said, "Well, I think we can fix. I think we can do it. I think we can make them be all right." And I said, oh, "Okay," because I was 18, 19 years old. You know, I was just beginning to learn, and so, um, of course. They didn't know that I was a, that I was a maniac hot rodder either. You know, <laughs> I drove the heck out of that thing. But uh, that was the 454 I put in my '64 panel truck. I don't know if I said about that, but my my car in high school. My, well, I had two of them. The first one uh, wrecked, got wrecked, and uh, my '64 Chevelle. I had a guy put a 350 in it, and then I ended up trading and selling it and stuff and. Anyway, the 64 uh, panel truck with a six-cylinder, I ended up putting a 454 in it. And then when that motor spun, spun a rod bearing, uh, I took it out and put my, I had bashed up my 670 SS Chevelle. I had both of them at, at the same time for a few years. I took the motor out of the, uh, I bent the frame. I, 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 my brakes faded. I was what they used to call, my buddy used to call it rat racing. And I was chasing him through the neighborhoods, which was a dumb idea. And he came to a T intersection, slammed on his brakes and turned right. Well, I, my brakes were, are, are, were overheated by that time and I couldn't slow down. And I, I went up over a curb and it was, a, it was exactly where there was a storm drain, you know. So the curb was big, about like that. Bent my frame and everything. And so I was never, I did straighten it out some, but I never got it back to right normal. And so, uh, no, I always knew SS Chevelle would be worth money one day, but I never dreamed what they would, what they're worth now. But anyway, I took the motor out, that 402 big block. I loved that motor. Put it in my '64 panel truck. Had it, had it in there for quite a few years, and then ended up selling the panel truck because I needed money for a down payment to buy some land. So, because by that time I was a, I was a married dad with three kids. You know, well I was married when I had, the, when I put the motor in there, I was married with one or one kid. You know. Anyway, I was still young, but um, so uh, I still got way off. Okay, so um, run flat tires. I've always, uh, ev all these years since '92, you know, like having the tires, even if you don't wear out the tread, they still just get you know, just start cracking and blow out, blow out, and. Uh, so I've tried to look, you know, on the internet over the years, I've kind of looked at anything I thought would be an alternative that wasn't outrageously expensive. And, uh, uh, I, you know, I saw the, uh, I still haven't really seen how, what's the big difference between the government's, you know, the military run flat tires and, reg and the regular big mud tires. Uh, all of those big tires that they sell, they're not all. Most of them are, I don't believe, are considered run flat tires. But I think they have like a separate com bladder or compartment in them that, uh, you know, like even if the, say if it's punctured, say if it's like, say if it's punctured out here, there's still some space and then an, maybe an air bladder. I, I think I, I don't know, I should look it up or something. I have, but anyway, uh, and they had year. I spent ten years ago. Now there was a big thing all over YouTube, you know, and, and on websites. 
these new high-tech tires that all the military trucks are fixing to have. <coughs> and they're like, they're like honeycombs, you know, when you look at the side of them. They don't hold air. They're like rubber and wonder. I think they're kind of sort of a pl plasticized rubber. They're not just like regular tire rubber. They're more stiff. And they're like, when you look at them from the side, you can see through them and they're honeycombed, but they're supposed to be really tough. And I saw tests on them. They did test them on some Humvees and stuff. <coughs> and, um, you know, they're, they're supposed to stand up to <coughs> being shot. And I don't know if they're really, they might stand up a little bit to an IUD, but not, probably not. I think I saw one run over, they did a test where it ran over an IUD and it, it really damaged it bad, but it could still roll. Uh, I have seen a couple of videos where they, these really super new, expensive uh, military vehicles with run flat tires. And uh, I saw one, there's something, there's, it's not an, really an American vehicle. What is it? UMIT or something, or UNIT, UMT? Anyway, uh, it's one, uh, this was in Africa where this, People making their video went to go get to see it, and and it ran. And in the test, it ran over an IED, and it. Uh, and of course, the underside is like armored, so that you know to protect the driver and occupants. But those tires. Well, it's kind of like they lost half their air, but they still had enough air to drive on. Um, and only one of my or one of them I think lost it. Well, I think it had dualies on the back, but anyway. Uh, yeah, it's been a year since I saw that video, but only w one or maybe two of them, you know, were damaged and lost any air whatsoever. But uh, so I've been intrigued about that. <clears throat> and it, okay, so uh, it just hit me. I wonder. At watching him cut those wheels apart, and then he was he made a little he made a little uh, bead breaker. To get get his tire, his old there was old tires on these wheels. Some of the wheels he was using, he's using everything he's used. You know, he was getting those old tires off those old regular car tires, and uh, some of them, you know, uh, one of the first one the, he just showed one of them that he did the widening on and all that. And then he said, "Now only four more, to, three more to go." Actually, if he's going to have a spare, he's got four more to go. <laughs> but <laughs> um, I thought, okay. Should have started with this because I should have. Oh, I tried to. I should. Have, I, I didn't think I would go this far off the track, but uh, I thought, hmm. Wonder if you could uh, take take a, what you know, especially let's say like my blazer, ten-inch wheels, and if you could put a regular, you know, uh, it doesn't matter so much what kind, but a regular. Uh, car type tire that'll fit that fit minor 15 inch wheels. That's that's one thing that uh, makes it a little harder to find tires, real good bargains on tires because of the 15 inch wheels are not as common as they used to be. I think for Foreland they're really better because instead of it's the stupidest thing I ever seen to put a truck a tire that 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 thin you know that tall. I'm talking about from the pavement to the the bead to the tire where it goes on the wheel, this tall. That's ridiculous for a for truck, a four wheel or something that's going off road because when you hit rocks and things, you're gonna, you're gonna crush that, that bead and break it. I mean, it, it can happen uh, on a 15, you know, a, a 35 inch tire with a 15 inch wheel. But I have that much rubber, I'm air, you know, that much air and rubber between, not that much rubber, but I've got that much between the tread of the tire and the wheel, you know. And uh, <clears throat> uh, that thing, that it did not have lockers on it. They were they were regular differentials, but, but uh, and there were 308 gears. But that thing still did well. I, when I got it, first thing I did was have, I went and had the motor rebuilt, and uh, I had them put a. They call it an RV cam. It's about it's a 195 lift is what it is. That's about all the only spec I remember of it, but. For, I had it built for low-end torque because with those 35-inch tires and 3 gears, it was really high-geared. It would lug going down the highway. It was pretty crappy going down the highway when I first bought it. After I did that, it uh, 
it's fine. Uh, you know, it goes as fast as you need to go. I mean, you can go 80, but uh, if you're just cruising along, say at a normal speed, 65 or 70, and you come up in the hill, you're just gonna you're going to slow down. I mean, you I mean you can open it up all the way, and it'll you're just wasting gas. You know, I mean, you you're not you can gain a little bit. Of, you know, up here. if you're if you're going the faster you are, the better. You know, with any kind of big heavier, well, any vehicle, the faster you're going, the better you'll make it up the hills. But <clears throat> uh, anyway, um, so I'm going off in circles again. So if you just took some kind of, and I was, well, I don't know that it really matters whether, okay, some kind of car tire. I was thinking of nylon bias instead of uh, instead of. Uh, Steel bolted tires, which I suppose you could get those in a small narrow tire nowadays. They're not very, you know, they're not easy to get anymore. Nylon bias tires, especially not at a high enough speed rating for the highway. Uh, tires didn't use, you know, nylon bias tires didn't used to blow out, and I don't care how old and cracked they got, they would still hold air. My '54 Chevelle, Chevelle, my '54 Chevy Bel Air had some old nylon bias tires on it. And they were cracked like crazy. And I was scared of them until I drove it around a bit. They, and there's only one of them that ever uh, I had to replace. It got too big of a hole in it. it ran over something. They're not, they they will get big holes in them if you run over big things. They, they will do that. And then they, the hole will get so big that, you know, it's not, you don't want it. You could patch it, but you don't, it's not safe because if anything ever hits that spot again, it, it's going to let that air out too quick. And if you're going fast, it could be dangerous, you know. But, uh, you can put well, you can put tubes in them. See, I've done it before. You can put tubes in them, and if, like, say, say you do get a big hole, and you want to put a patch over it on the inside, and then put a tube in it, and you'll be you'll be all right. <coughs> and uh, but steel belted radials, you try to put a tube in them. I, I don't care how new that tire is. Them little steel belts, they they poke through on the inside, and they're going to poke holes, millions of holes in your in your tubes. You can't really run tubes in steel belted tires, most of them. So, because I thought about doing that with my uh, my tires, you know, before they, when they were getting showing signs of being cracked, like one of them I have, it's just cracked, and it hasn't blown out. And just to, I thought about, well, maybe I can just get a tube and slip it in there, just to keep it rolling until I get some new tires or something. Sure, it can, but not, you know, just remember, don't go 70, you know. <laughs> but uh, then I remembered, oh, yeah, when you look inside of pretty much any, Especially if the tire's old enough that you're thinking about putting a tube in it, then if it's a steel belted, you're going to have metal in it, little metal wires sticking in there. That's going to even one is all it takes, you know, to to make your tube make it go down. So and that goop and all that stuff isn't worth a tire that big. I put fix a flat in one when I first had the truck. I put fix a flat in it a couple of times. Uh, and that. I think, I don't know if I did it to more than one wheel. <laughs> it might have been the wheel that rusted a hole in it, but boy, talk about rust. That stuff, don't put it in, I don't care what kind of wheels you got, but steel wheels, it will just destroy the, one, the inside of your wheels with rust. And it don't even, <clears throat> it's, it's got to be an awful tiny hole for it to even plug it up. And that slime and all that, I've never tried it, but it costs too much money. Actually, I have tried it way back when it first came out. But it costs so much money. You you should you just gonna just buy another tire. Even if you like, if your tires are two hundred dollars or two two seventy five each, and you can't, I mean, that's the only thing that's gonna fit your vehicle or the only thing you're gonna stand for. Then you can't afford a new one. Get a get a used one. But if you surely if you keep shopping, you'll find something. But <clears throat> okay, so my idea here is so what if you mount a narrow tire? One that's just wide enough to make the 10 inch wheel that I have. Uh, even if it's bowed out just a little bit, it might actually be helpful in what I'm trying to do. You know, people do that on purpose now. They'll put, they'll put wide wheels and narrow tires, and it'll be, be like that, you know, and it looks ridiculous. I, I, it's the stupidest thing. I've, I've seen people do it because they didn't have the money to. You know, they had the tires, they had the wheels, and they didn't didn't have money. I, I remember seeing people doing it way back in the 70s, but it was they were embarrassed. Of it. You know, now people do it on purpose, and it's a dangerous thing. If you if you hit 
a rock on the road or a, some kind of bump of any kind or bump a curb or something, that tire will just, just like that, off that wheel. And you'll instant, you know, instant no air. <clears throat> um, so it's really dangerous to do that. And I'll tell you what, the, one of the, the scariest, uh, one of the most scariest things that ever happened to me uh, is having, I've had I don't know, five probably blowouts on that blazer uh, with those tires when they get old. You never know when they're going to go. And I mean, I wasn't even, I wasn't going, I don't remember how fast I was going. I don't, I, well, I might have been going 60 one time, but it was the back tire. But when the front tire goes, man, you're wrestling a bear trying to keep that thing on the road. Because when they blow out, there's just instantly no air. Don't hit the brakes. Don't rip the wheel one way or the other. Just let off the gas. Let it slow down. If your front tire blows out, I don't care what kind of vehicle you got. They don't teach people this anymore, I don't think. But <clears throat> don't hit the brakes until you have coasted down to like below 10 miles an hour. Probably five and below. Because the instant you hit the brakes, it's going to go whichever direction your tire's down on, you know. And uh, <clears throat> so if you're going 30, 45 and you, and you even and you slam on the brakes or even just try to give it a little break, you're still able to get out of control. And that blazer is uh, being tall like that. If you're going that fast, 45 and above, and you, you know, when you hit the brakes and it turns, you're liable to roll it. That's what's dangerous. But anyway, <clears throat> so this is why... So if you had a narrower tire but still could fit on your 10-inch wheel, um, put it on there first, and and not too tall of a tire, you know. Like there, it's easy to get those tires that are very low profile nowadays. So get one of those, put it on the wheel. Uh, and my my one of my ideas of this was maybe if you could get nylon bias tires instead of uh, instead of uh, <clears throat> this is all keep. To, have, to make your own, to build your own run flat tire. This is what I'm getting at. Build your own run flat tire. <laughs> um, <clears throat> if you could get nylon bias, it would fit in there like that. Um, and then put a tube in it. Drill you an extra hole for your tube uh, stem, valve stem, to come out of. Um, probably would offset it directly like Say if your if your normal one was on the bottom, put it on the top, for to, because that's just enough to perhaps make the balance even. Those mud tires, you're never gonna get get them. You get them in balance, and then uh, they'll just uh, they'll go out of balance again pretty soon. You know, uh, especially if you go on an off road a lot. You know, and you bang you you bounce them around and hit rocks and do this and that. <clears throat> Big rocks, I'm talking about. And, but anyway, um, so you put that, put, so let's just say exactly my, my, my ideal I idea is to have a nylon bias tire, tube in it, and then, and it's, it's, ne it's, it's low enough profile that you can still get your big old mud tire over it and mount it on the wheel. And so when you um, air up your inside tire first, that'll push your beads out all your beads out, especially with the inner tube, you wouldn't have the one problem I was thinking, okay, how are you going to get those things, to, all the beads to seat, you know? Because I think the, the inside tire would seat up against the inside, you know, the rubbers, rubber to rubber, it should seal. It wouldn't, wouldn't nest matter that it's not touching the, the bead of the wheel, you know, the bead of the tire is touching the rim, of the edge of the rim. Uh, and with an inner tube, for darn sure, uh, you air up that inner tube, that's going to seat all of your, all of your wheels, you know. I mean, well, the end, it won't matter if the inside tire leaks because it's the inner tube holding the air. Okay, so then your big tire, that'll push its, its bead out to the wheel for you. You won't have to fight that. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're, if you well, I don't know if I'd try that myself even when I was young. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> with or without a tire machine, that, that would be helpful because I've seen them. With my tires, putting changing my tires for me at the tire shops, uh, I've seen them fight and fight to get those things to you know to when, uh, when they're uh, stiff. You know, brand new tires are sometimes a lot stiffer, and they they can be hard to. You can't just set it down on the ground and push on it. You know, I've, well I've seen them 
sometimes have to go get a strap and wrap it around there and tighten it down until it comes out. A lot of people don't, when they show you how to do, how to be, get a bead on a tire, they don't hardly ever show that. Simplest way to do that is get just get a ratchet strap, crank it down on it. I don't care if you got a tire machine or if you're out there and you're under the shade tree, you know, get that ratchet strap on it. And it's easier to do it with the wheel standing up if you're doing that than it is with it laying down. Actually, it's easier to, I, I you know, I've, I've um, broken beads and put them back, you know, like to replace valve stems and stuff enough times you want to go spend 10 15 20 dollars getting somebody to do that <clears throat> and uh and uh so i've done it and uh usually i could just put my knee in the top of the wheel and push hard and it would finally come out and pop it you know but uh if your tires are really stiff and especially with those big old mud tires if they're new if they're Old and stiff or new, new and stiff, and kind of when they're in between, they've been work run a while. They'll be kind of more softer and pliable. So anyway, um, that's the thing uh, that I just I swear it'd be worth trying. Just put you a low. I hadn't thought about low profile tires until I started talking about them a minute ago. But yeah, uh, the only you know the one trick, one hard thing to do would be to get the. Uh, the, the the big big mud tire over the other tire, but if it was uh, at, um, really low profile, it, all you need is if you just have five four or five inches of tire left that has air in it, you won't be riding on the rim, and uh, and you know how people. Uh, and you don't, the whole, and the idea is to have uh, space. Of course, on the, on, the, on the side walls, you won't really have any space, you know, too much. But the, the, the one inside is going to kind of go like that. So close, right close to the wheel, you won't have as much space. But the further you go out, it'll be air up in there. And so if you run over a freaking, you know, 10 inch nail, well, maybe not that, but if you run over a nail, a 16 penny nail or something, it's probably, not, it might it, it might hit the inner tire, but it probably won't go through it because it'll be slowed down enough. Or the kind of things you'd run into out four wheeling, you know, like a really sharp branch, just a tree limb or something, you know, so, or a sharp rock or something. Uh, anything, let's just say you got, if you get a puncher, as long as it wasn't sharp enough and long enough to go through both the outer tire and the inner tire, you're still going to have something to ride on. <clears throat> and people nowadays, I, I heard, I saw it in the magazines. I subscribed to Four by Four magazine, Four Wheel Drive magazine back in the day, and <clears throat> I, uh, you know, they're always writing about airing down your tires and all that. And but they, but they would say back in those days. But there's one thing you got to watch out for. You know, your wheel, your tires log would come off your wheel, and uh, that's the last thing I want when I'm out somewhere all by myself out riding in trails. I really always went by myself. I didn't really have anybody to go with. There wasn't a lot of people into it back, uh, you know, it, that I knew. <coughs> it was, there was, it was pretty popular in the early '90s, but. <coughs> I just didn't really know anybody that did it other than the guy at the, I did, when I first got the truck, I would take it to a four-wheel drive shop, and he was into it, and his guys that worked there, but they were too busy working to go out and ride. <laughs> but uh, we, me and the guy that owned the shop, we got to kind of, you know, get to know him, and we had said we'd go out, ride. I'd show him some trails I'd found, you know, but we never ended up doing it. <clears throat> but... Uh, Anyway, uh, that is really interesting to me um, because <clears throat> so you got your big old tire, so you got this, you got it's a lot of rubber between my 15 inch wheel and how tall 30, regular 35 inch mud train tire is, <clears throat> uh, and if you have another tire inside of there, and I think the inner tube would be a key to making it be able to air it all up right and make it. You know the inner tire hold air. I think the inner tube would be the way to go. And uh, <clears throat> and so then if you 
if you get something in the tire, if you gash the side out of it, but it's, until that tire completely falls apart, and if it's fairly new, it, it, it wouldn't, uh, you know, you're going to notice it because you're going you're gonna to lose half of your height of your tire. Out. And uh, so you take it easy and get on out of where you're at, you know. Uh, as a matter of fact, you could air, I would think you could air down that outer tire to 15 pounds safely that way, safer that way. Yeah, I see people do it. Uh, some people, that's just, they do it. They have to air down those tires. They go down to 10 pounds. You know, they go down to seven. I saw one guy was saying, this is a guy that makes videos that uh, he's a good driver. I mean, he, he's a, he's a, he does, a, he's a, runs a record service, got, uh, he's, uh, and, but he also has a, he rescues people that are stuck out four-wheeling, and he uses a Jeep to do it with a big, not a Jeep, but a SUV Jeep. You know, they call it, he calls it a Jeep. But <coughs> it's like a blazer, but a Jeep, you know. <coughs> Are you people that don't know what a blazer is? It's like a Bronco, but a Jeep. <coughs> it seems like everybody, people would ask me, is that a Bronco? Especially girls. I say, no, it's a Chevy. And then just look at me. <laughs> because the Broncos a Ford, you know, and they did. I was trying to joke, you know, like I do like I do have always liked uh, Chevys better than Fords. When I was as a kid growing up, my mom had a Mercury, which was made by Ford, and it was I worked on it, and it was really hard to work on. And um, every Ford, I, and once I started learning how to work on cars, which was well, I started learning when I was twelve, but I really began to learn by the time I got my own car when I was sixteen. I was I knew I liked Chevys. <clears throat> And uh, they were so much easier to work on, more horsepower out of the factory, uh, parts cheaper, you know, just all the all the good stuff. But uh, anyway, um, I just think that's interesting as I'll get out. And now for me, I never when I used to four wheel all the time, I never aired down. I ran thirty. If I did, I'd air down like three or four pounds. I ran 36 pounds normally in my tires, and uh, you know I might go down to 34 if I if I was going to be going on uh, hard rocks or something, you know. But usually I didn't. I didn't do it hardly ever because it's just so much trouble, you know. All I had to to air my tires back up was a little cigarette lighter air thing, and you know. To air, uh, to put that much, just to put from 34 to 36 in, the, in four tires was going to take you an hour, you know. <sighs> and let's see, I, uh, where I lived at the time and where I was riding around was uh, not out here in the country where I grew up and where I live now again. I lived up right in the middle between Dallas and Fort Worth in the Bedford Euless area. And, uh, that's when they started charging you to put air in your tires at the gas stations. You know, you could hardly find a gas station where you didn't have to pay. And you'd get like, five, if you're lucky, five minutes of air, you know. So you, you get one and a half tires and then you got to put some more money in there. Now, I think it, it was, whatever it cost back then, it made me mad. But now it costs a fortune. I think it's like a dollar or something. But anyway... Um, I didn't need to air down. I, I think I, I always thought, well, why is everybody doing that? You know, I was like, okay, they have the same size of tires I had, same size of wheels I have, because they had mentioned that and I'd pay attention to it. But they think they have to air down. And no matter where they go, uh, that guy I was just talking about, he goes in the sand a lot. Now, I never did a whole lot of sand, so I know that sand is really tricky. But uh, But he's also... And for, you know, well, I watched a bunch of his videos kind of on and off last month or so. Uh, <clears throat> don't remember his name. I couldn't tell you or the name of his channel even if I wanted to. But uh, <clears throat> he, uh, he, he knows what he's doing. There's a lot of these young people that they tell you how you ought to be doing things, and you can tell they don't even have a clue what they're doing. They don't know how to drive. They don't know how to work on their vehicle. But they know how to air down those tires. <coughs> and uh, I never needed to. 
I didn't have lockers and I didn't have trouble. Uh, I could climb. It's high enough that the carburetor would, uh, steep enough that the carburetor would, uh, you know, when, when, when I have a carburetor. When you have a carburetor, you get, you get too steep, the, carb, the gas will not come out of the jets, you know. But if you pump the, pump the accelerator pump, then you'll keep it running. And I just, the first time I got on a hill that steep, I instinctively did that because I, was always, I worked on motors all the time, and that's just what I learned to do without even thinking about it. So I made it up that hill <laughs> barely, but I didn't try it again after that because <clears throat> it almost died and rolled backwards down the hill. But it wasn't a real long hill, but it was very steep. But uh, um, there's one place where I used to go ride. It was called the 360 Trails. And there was a couple of ways to get in. And, uh, one way I learned to get in there, the first way, you would be on one. The trails are on the left. Uh, say that if you're going down the, it's a wide freeway, you know, two, like two to three lanes on each side, you know, with the median in the middle. And uh, so you would go off in this vacant area, vacant lot, like several acres, and you would go down through there, and then you would turn and go under a, an overpass that went over a, 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 well, a river, a big creek. I don't remember if it was a river or a creek. I think it was a river. It was way too big to be a creek. So you go under there, and you had to go on the embankment, and part of it was in the dirt, and then you'd get on the concrete part, and it was pretty scary because my truck's pretty tall and it's scary to me. Uh, even after doing it several times, I was still pretty leery. Anyway, I took it slow and easy through there, and then there was just miles and miles of trail. I mean, 10 miles of trails of undeveloped land. It was owned by somebody, but uh, <clears throat> some companies, I think. But uh, that was where you could just go forever. Um, I mean... Well, anyway, I, 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 uh, it was really odd in between. I mean, I grew up out here in the country. I, next, I always call it next door to the country. And uh, there's land everywhere out here, you know, but it's all private property. You can't go four wheeling on it or anything. But that was the widest, biggest place to ride, to drive in four wheel land. People rode motorcycles all over it. Uh, <clears throat> and so, but I noticed, I saw somebody doing it one day. Uh, when you're on the other side, it's kind of more level with the road when you come into the first, you know, you get on the service, you you come off, you're going down the service road, and instead of getting up on the highway, you just jump the curb and go through this land, go back under there. And then once you get on the other side, is where the miles of trails were. It's all woodsy, and there's a, the river. Um, of course, you're on this side of the river, the first area I learned about was on that other side of the river, and it's a good size and a lot of fun. It had a big old pond. Some people would drive through. I wouldn't do it because it was like six feet deep or so. Uh, and mine was a daily driver. I'd drive it to work every day. I wasn't about to mess my truck up. <clears throat> One guy was trying to get me to do it. Guy at the, that worked for the guy at the four-wheel shop. But uh, he had this truck. That's all he did with it, you know, and it was way up taller than mine. And he said, oh, I've been through it a bunch. You got to try it. You know, it's, you know, like your chicken to try it. Hey, my truck's a daily driver, right? And I had nice carpet, nice cloth seats in my truck. It wasn't nothing fancy, but it was in good shape. And uh, I did get it. I did get water in it that time I I got stuck in the lake though, and I tore up my. I don't think I mentioned I tore up my spider gears and I couldn't get out. That's why the guy I couldn't. That's why I couldn't get out and why I had to get. Somebody finally pulled me out. The the guy that ran the place. This was called. I can't think what it was called. It was a government land that they, uh, they it was a park, basically, for people to four-wheel and ride motorcycles in. Uh, now, I can't think, Rowan, it's in Roanoke, Texas. I can't think of the name. At, at the end of, at the, I guess you'd say the north end of Grapevine Lake. I cannot think of the name of that. That was a place, and it was free to go there, too. That was a place, but before, when it got dark, that man run you out of there, that old man. <laughs> I had to leave my truck overnight that night. He got me out. Well, he didn't get me out. He got a hold of a farmer that lived down the road, and he came up there with a backhoe, and he got me out of the water. But then that's when I realized, I found out. Well, I already knew there was something wrong with the rear end. I heard it crunch and break. But I was trying to drive out of there, and my passenger side rear axle, my rear wheel was going out like this. And 
I'd drive it until the axle, it was sticking out about two, two and a half, three feet, and then I would jack it up and shove it back in. And so he thought it was too dark and I had to leave. So but he, he, he helped me. And, he, he, and that farmer, after I left it overnight, the farmer came back with a trailer and he pulled my truck down to his place and let me leave it there for a few days until I could get a, what it is, I just bought a, a ring gear and pinion set up from the junkyard and put it in there and back in business. I was scared that I believed all the magazine stuff and I was afraid to use it because it wasn't tightened to the right specs and all that. And the guy, at the old buddy at the junkyard, he said, it'll be fine, just put it in there, drive it. Well, I wouldn't listen to him and so I never hooked up the drive shaft. I just drove it on the front shaft for a month or so until I, I mean, I was so worried about it. And I, I uh, what was really funny is I had been, I, at that time I was laid off from my good job at General Dynamics. And, uh, but in the meantime, they called me back and I went back there. And so after a couple, few weeks, a month or so, going from, you know, unemployment or maybe I was out of unemployment by that time, uh, to 1660 an hour around that. That's what I was making when I got laid off the last time in 92. But uh, I think the lot, they let, I think only, they only, we only got to stay about two or three more years and then they laid us off again, most of, a whole bunch of us. But anyway, uh, um, I, I bought, I went to, it's called Mike's Off-Road, which was in Euless back then, but it's in Fort Worth now. Uh, I had him put me a used rear end in it, the whole thing, because I was so worried about that ring gear. And now I realize, it wasn't long after that I realized that I, all I had to do was just 50 $75 I paid for that ring gear and pinion, all I had to do was just use it. Because the buddy in the junkyard, and he knew what he was doing, he worked on cars all his life, but you know, I thought, well, junkyard guys don't do things right, you know, I always thought that. <clears throat> But uh, they also know a lot of things that uh, our average mechanic wouldn't do because, uh, well, they'd, they got to, you know, if they're going to guarantee anything, they wouldn't do so. You know, they wouldn't take any risk because it's just going to cause some more money and more, more, more labor or headaches or whatever in the end. But uh, <clears throat> so anyway, yeah, I spent $550, $750 getting another user area and put in it when I really already had it fixed. <clears throat> that would have, and the one I put in there was, uh, it had all kinds of slop in it. I mean, it's the one that's still in there now. But it had, oh, a ha good half inch of slop in it. So it was, I think the other one might have been a little tighter than that one. I don't remember now. Anyway. Um, um, <clears throat> oh, man. I'm telling four wheeling stories now. But. Um, I've always wanted, ever since, I, ever since my first set of tires got old and started blowing out, uh, you know, they don't, they didn't make them as good as they did. Back in 92, I, I bought, let's see, my first set probably lasted, I don't remember, let's say they lasted two years. And I bought, I had money then, <clears throat> so I bought, I bought the truck in 92, had the motor rebuilt and all that stuff. And, uh. I bought another set. I like the BF Goodrich tires on mud trains. I like the tread, and they really work good off road. And uh, and they worked. They were they were fine. The only problem I ever had is those mud any of those mud any brand of those mud tires, is if you're if you if it's raining or if there's water. You know, generally it's raining when there's water on the road. But if you hit a puddle of water, I mean, like a big one, then it, they will hydroplane so easy, and you will just skate. You know. And so you really have to, you really don't want to drive over 45 when there's water on the sides of the road, you know. And uh, <coughs> um, and usually if I see a big bunch of water, I would slow down. I'd be going 45 and I'd slow down to go through it. I had a couple of scary times with that before I realized, you know. That's the only problem I ever had, though, like I said, I never aired down, at least not no more than like the 34 pounds. But the thing is, I, I didn't really get to it. With 15 inch wheels, I think this is what made a big difference because I've been watching these other people on, you know, watching the videos and just showing the close ups of them going over rocks and sand and whatever they're doing. And um, 
I can see the tires that are aired down really how they lay out and grip on, especially on rocks, slick things, you know. And I think it really it seems to really, I can kind of see it helping in sand in those videos I've been watching. But I don't know if I ever got to the part, that guy, uh, the ones that'll be honest about it, like he, one of the times he went out to go rescue somebody, he act, this one time, only time I've ever seen it, he's really good at it. And he, if he needs help, he gets somebody else to go out there with him. And, and they get stuff out that you just wouldn't think they could get out uh, without a crane wrecker, you know, like one of those military crane wreckers. But uh, they do it. Because <clears throat> you can't get, well, the places they go, you can't get a huge truck to those places, you know. I don't think a military six by six wrecker could actually get to some of those places he goes to. Uh, so, uh, anyway, he, he, he said one, the worst one I ever saw for him is he, 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 his tires came off the bead three or four times on the way to where he was going. And I think it finally got dark and, um, uh, I think he called his, he's a, he has a buddy that helps him sometimes that has a, he, he's got this yellow Jeep, uh, 35 inch, I think he was actually, the tires he's been running are those Patagonia, those cheap, those tires that are, they're, they're a brand that I've never heard of before, but in the last couple of years I've seen them and they're about the cheapest mud tires you can get, but I've seen a lot of reviews and pictures of them with huge holes in the side and they said, Showing and really bad rock rash. They must be really soft rubber. That's one thing with mud tires, any kind of tire. But mud tires, okay, soft rubber grips better, but it's soft and it cuts easy. And, and in a regular tire, it'll just wear out faster. And with the mud tires, I bought us, uh, I used to buy BF Goodrich mud trains. They're not too hard, not too soft rubber. They will last if you don't drive it. Well, when I used to drive it every day, they would still last about four or five years when I drove the truck every day, 35 miles two ways, you know, to work and back, 60, 70 miles a day and more, you know, here and there. Um, but then when I got to where I didn't drive it every day, then they would last seven years and the only reason they quit, they just started cracking and leaking and blow, cracking and blowing out because just like one time one of my tires, I used to park it out in the street and uh, one of the tires blew out just because it's just sitting there. The sun shining on it every afternoon. I think that just raised the pressure with the tire was old and it just blew out. Uh, the rest, most of the rest of them. Well, I've had in the last 10, 15 years, I haven't been driving anything much at all, and so they usually do go down in the driveway or something. It's in the driveway now, but one uh, one of the ones that blew out on me driving. Uh, <clears throat> That was, well, that was a, that was the only time I only a few times I've really been scared uh, in the vehicle, and 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 I had blowouts here and there when I was younger on regular. Uh, I never had a I don't I never had a blowout on a nylon bias tire, but I, when they after this everything went to steel belt radials, uh, they're pretty bad about blowing out back then when they were new. Uh, I don't guess there's as bad about it now if they're not. I'm, I mean, this is a fairly new tire, uh, just a regular. You know, street tire, and I had uh, several blowouts with them, and, but but it didn't uh, get crazy like it does on that Blazer because this suspension. You know, one of them was a Ford pickup, a work truck, uh, like a '75 Ford half-ton work truck that I drove, and uh, I had one or two blowouts on it, but it never got sc nothing scary happened, even on the front, you know. But with the Blazer, with the straight axles on the front and you know back, of course. Uh, uh, it just, it's more more inclined to, you know, really go one way or the other whenever something happens. Um, so, I've always, uh, I always wanted, well, you're just not going to get more life out of those kind of tires other than, uh, like, I bought some called Mud Kings, and they're supposedly was made by VF Goodrich, but branded Mud King, and they're che made cheaper. And I found out after buying a set of those, I bought it. I had bought a new, you know, after my first or second set of brand new 35 inch uh, BF Goodrich, I could save two to $400 buying the Mud Kings. And so I bought the Mud Kings, but they, uh, you know, the front ends, you just can't keep the front ends in alignment on those old, those old things. Uh, and so those tires really, really wore fast on the front and way, way too fast. So. But I did keep the end up, well, I started driving it less, and I, and those tires, they were the, 
think those were the first ones that blew out and scared the crap out of me because they just blew out when they didn't even look cracked, you know. And I think I had two or three of them blow out. And, uh, and by those years back in the, well, from I guess around 2001 or two on, well, there were some time, couple, some times in the 90s where, I, well, usually I had bought new tires and then they might be four or five years old, but they were hanging on, you know. But in the, yeah, from around 2002 on, I really didn't have the money to uh, buy brand new tires. I would just have to try to find used ones wherever I could. And they're hard to find because everybody, those expensive tires, everybody drive, rides them until they're just about, you know, there's not a, not even a, you'd be lucky to get a quarter inch tread on. I mean, those things have like almost an inch tread when they're new. But, <clears throat> um, you'd be lucky to get some that would pass inspection, which is actually, uh, I forget the actual measurement, but I learned many years ago that if you just stick a penny, that it's a penny, not a dime or a nickel. People don't even know, these kids don't even know that. You stick a penny in there, and if it covers up Abraham Lincoln's head, it's legal, and if it doesn't, if you can see, you know, if you can see all of his hair, then uh, uh, they're not 730 seconds, I don't know. Throw out a number that's completely wrong, but uh, just came to my head. <clears throat> anyway, they won't make it. And uh, I use that all these all, ever since back in the 70s when I learned that, and it's always been good measurement. But uh, a dime is very different. It's a lot less space. And uh, had some some kids at the inspection place tell me, "Oh, it's a dime." I didn't argue with them because <clears throat> I wanted them to inspect my truck. <laughs> But um, anyway, um, so there's my idea. Go over this one more time. Yeah, I get you a low-profile tire. Doesn't have to be anything fancy, expensive. As a matter of fact, if you could even find maybe a, I don't know, a trailer tire, tractor tire. I mean, you, it doesn't. Need, you, you're gonna. You want to be able to go 70 miles an hour. It needs to have that. I don't remember those ratings, but. There's ratings as to how fast they can spin without flying apart. You don't want anything that, if you're going to drive it on the highway, you want something that's really rated way above the speed you're going to drive. I would say about about twice the speed you're going to drive. Well, that would be too, I guess you really can't realistically do that. Above, whatever, as much above the speed you're going to drive, which is going to be 70, 75 miles an hour for me on that laser. And I won't stay at that for very long, you know. Uh, <clears throat> I try to drive. If I'm on the highway for a long period of time, I'll try to stay in the sweet zone to where it's not lugging going up and down the hills, but you're not having to open up the full barrel to keep it going at that speed. It is, it is a, well, I, it's a holly, I have a holly on it. I had a holly 600 on it when I bought it, and it was kind of old and gunky, and I'd bought a brand new one and put it on there and have it, and I've rebuilt it once and it needs to rebuild it again. But uh, I always, I, for years and years, I've dr thought about trying. But it costs so much. I mean, if you buy one of those Holly EFI systems, uh, it's going to be 1200 bucks, you know, to convert it to that, to EFI. And I don't think you're going to gain two miles a gallon. So if I could find a way to gain some real mileage, you know, I, I would be all up for that. I think, well, Mike told me off road, he told me years ago, you need to put lower gears in it, like two, 256s or something. Uh, because you, if you're running big tires, you're, you've got to realize with 308 gears and 35-inch tires, that's why I really don't need to go anything any bigger than that. You know, I don't really need anything bigger than that. Uh, you, I just think they're cool. You know, I did. I'm not as worried, not as excited about that sort of thing now as I used to be. But when everybody started running those 45 and 48-inch tires, I just thought they looked so cool. Well, you can you can go over so much more. You can go over bigger obstacles. You can go in deeper holes. You know, you can go in deeper water. I mean, it's very practical. But I just when I see something is, I don't go by just what I mean. Everybody likes the looks or don't like the looks of things. But and I definitely do. You know, like big old four wheelers and stuff. But <clears throat> but I always think of the practical aspect. Uh, I don't go for just for looks. I go practical first, look second. Uh, so, uh, so you get your, uh, get your low profile tire, 
Put you an inner tube in it. It's the same old, same, just say I'm using the same 10 inch wagon, steel wagon wheels. Uh, and that's something I have, I always thought this would be the case, and I'm seeing it happen to people when they have aluminum wheels. Well, aluminum is very slick. And uh, well, first thing that'll happen when, with, when, especially if you got old, if you're, we, I don't care, your old steel wheels and they start rusting inside and yet didn't, you know, when are you ever going to get them down and paint them, get the tires off and, and clean them up and paint them? Well, it never happened for me, you know. I'm not, when their tires are off, it's because I'm getting new tires, you know. And so uh, it just never really could, buy, you know, have a good way to do that unless I, uh, to, to redo those wheels. My tires would just, that rust would be on the bead, and those tires would be glued to those rims so there wasn't no no danger of those things coming off of the bead i uh, probably could have uh ran them low at low pressure but uh, the thing i never wanted to do that because when you have low pressure and you're out foiling you don't know what you're going to hit and you're romping on it you want to go fast and have fun if you don't got enough if you don't got enough uh, air in your tire then you're just gonna you're gonna just cut that bead clean in two on whatever you hit, a rock, a stump, or, you know, whatever it might be. And uh, um, even just like I, when I was talking about riding those 360 trails, when it would rain, uh, one time I was in there and it had rained a lot and it was just drying up. It had dried up pretty good. There was still mud around, but... It was everybody had been four wheeling in there, so there was all these tracks this deep, you know, this deep. And so, if you go with them, you, you know, you could, you, I would go across them so that as much as I could because, uh, well, I didn't want to get, you know, it's still water and muddy down in the bottom of those tracks. So, that's another thing. People always drive in other people's tracks, don't ever drive in other people's tracks. I don't care if it's a truck. Or a, a motor, especially a motorcycle. If you're going off road, stay out of the tracks with water in them. You don't know how deep they are. You don't know how soft they are. You're going to be you're going to be bogged up to axles in no time if you do that. Go catty corner over them, you know, or go across them if if you can go a different direction, you know. Uh, but anyway, going across those things, doubt uh, it was too rough to go slow, so I would speed up. And I felt the hard hits, you know, a lot of times. And one day I had been in there and it was like that. And uh, I had, uh, well, I was talking about being married. When I was young, I was married. I got divorced in 89. And so this was after that. And I had a girlfriend and we were going out to the trails. And we'd go, we'd go up in there and find a nice spot up in the shade trees and just sit there for a while and get set on the hood of the truck and stuff. And one day we had done that, and then I've seen a truck down there running this way and that, and then uh, he got out of sight but and didn't hear him anymore. And I thought, hmm, wonder what happened with him. He got trouble, you know? And so then we decided, we, we came, decided to come out about, you know, 10, 20 minutes later, and there was a guy down there in all that mud, all those mud tracks, uh, with, with the tire off the beat, and... <clears throat> Mad as a hornet at his truck, you know. And so um, I, 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 I had just been through all over that place. And I said, I wonder why that happened, you know. And I offered to help him. Oh, I've got it, you know. But anyway, I asked him. Ended up, he said something about he aired his tires down or something. And I don't remember what all he said. He aired his tires down and they came off the bead and he was surprised. But, well, I think he was saying, well, I should have known. I don't remember. He was really blaming the truck in life, you know, not himself. But um, and I wasn't being mean to him or anything, but trying to help him because uh, you know when you're when you're up, when you're stuck and you're upset like that, you're always going to be pretty cranky. But uh, he did something I had never seen anybody do before, and this is in '93 or '4 or something, I think. <clears throat> um, he, you know, it was way off the bead, and it's on the car the truck. He had is a back back wheel. And he, and he probably, I think he had aluminum wheels, too. That's another thing I, I would think about now a lot more than I used to. <coughs> anyway, he uh, he grabbed a can of WD-40 and, and a lighter. 
sprayed that stuff in there, and, whoosh, <laughs> and I just I saw him doing it, and I thought, well, I, I was used to spraying WD-40 to get on the wheel and the tire to uh, get it to slip over the the bead, get the bead set, and he had a compressor that he you know as well, and oh no, he didn't have a compressor. He didn't have a compressor, but I did. I had my little cigarette lighter compressor. And that was what I was offering to, you know, maybe air it up for him or something, help him air it up. But uh, he sprayed that, and he said, uh, and then he went, before I knew it, he he grabbed that lighter and uh, and lit it, and it went poof. And just as he started to do it, he says, look out. And, 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 uh, and I was like, dang that works I never thought of doing that you know and he's like well yeah, everybody does that you know so, you know like and uh, anyway uh, and I got a big puff of hot air in my face because uh, I was two three feet you know I was kind of bent over looking at what he was doing because I was interested you know and uh, anyway I think if I remember, I don't know. I kind of think that I said, well, you need, I got a little air compressor if you want to put some more air in it. He said, I think that'll be enough. That'll give it about 10 to 14 pounds. And it was, it was, it was, I couldn't, I still don't, I never really, I've seen people do it on YouTube now, you know, but uh, in, a, in a fix like that, uh, that got him back on there and where he could drive it again. And basically, I don't remember what I asked, I, at the time, I'm, I'm pretty sure I asked him what he was running at and everything. I was trying to evaluate if I, and I told him I never aired down, you know, and I don't, and I, I never got stuck. I never had trouble getting stuck, you know. Not in mud, not, well, I didn't drive, not, I, I don't like seeing that. When I was younger, I, growing up, I rode motorcycles a lot, dirt bikes, and I was never good in the sand, and he always can bury up. I got, I dang near got buried up in the sand at that, uh, a uh, place by the lake. Uh, there was this hidden beach that you, you know, you could only either get to it from the lake or from that four-wheel drive park, that motorcycle four-wheel drive park. And uh, I found that beach one day, and dang near got stuck in there. But uh, if you're in sand, don't stop until you get to some that's damp or get the heck out off of it. Don't stop in the soft, fluffy sand. <laughs> or don't slow down too much in there either. But anyway. Uh, yeah, I went through. I went through one place where I later realized I should have never went in there. But it was all the lake had ri risen, and so it's all three feet, you know, two to three to four feet deep water. And I drove for yards, you know, a hundred yards through all that. And then after it, the lake went back down, and I saw it, I was like, I cannot believe I made it through there. Uh, I went through there, uh, and what it was, it was all baby trees, and, and you know, Johnson grass and all that crap, but a lot of bushes and scrub brush and stuff. That's what I was driving over. <laughs> stuff I really wouldn't have went right over if I could have seen it. <laughs> but uh, I was on a trail, and, and it just, you know, normally it would have winded on through that area, but since the water was up, and when I first hit it, I thought it was like a foot. You know, it, it, when I first hit the water, it was a foot, foot and a half deep. And after I got in there, I was like, good. I felt that, you know, and I just kept, you know, I just kept giving it an even amount of throttle and made sure I did not stop or if I felt, you know, I just, anyway, uh, I already played around in the dirt enough to know how to, you know, good, be decent at getting through stuff with just two wheel, really a one wheel drive vehicle, you know, a regular old Model 64 panel truck. The one good thing it had was a lot of weight on the back. The panel truck's heavy on the back, you know, it's a lot like a pickup. And uh, I used to off-road that thing when it still had the six cylinder and the three on the tree, you know. But uh, <clears throat> I don't think I did it much with it after I got the 454. But, um, I put heavier, I put bigger springs in it too, because that 54 was a lot heavier than a six cylinder. But I put uh, some some springs out of a well, I had had bought a 70 Impala. Did I put that? Yeah, I know I put. The, I think I did. Now I'm not sure. I know I wanted to if I didn't do it. <laughs> anyway, I had bought a when I back when I was still with T before I left home. I had bought a 70 Impala, 
because I wanted the 454 out of it. But I knew it had some water in it when I got it, but I didn't have enough sense to realize that it, in Texas, you don't think a lot about freezing. But, uh, well, the old man lied to me, you know. That's right. I traded my 64 Chevelle for that 70 Impala with the 350. That's what happened. I got ripped off. The 454 had uh, water setting in it. And uh, the carburetor was often had water setting in it, but I didn't figure that it had set long enough to freeze. Well, it had. I asked him, and he really didn't give me a real answer, and I should have known right then and there. But I wanted the 454, and my whole scheme was I had a 67 Chevelle body that I'd paid 25 bucks for, and I wanted a 454 for it. And and I was going to put a I put I did put a six cylinder in that 70 Impala and sold it, but I barely made out on it. Nobody wanted it. Well, I, I, I made a big mistake of having it painted at Earl Shibes Paint City or something like that in Fort Worth. And those, it's like a 50, $49 or $59 paint job. Well, uh, everybody thought it had been wrecked, and it hadn't been, but they thought it had been wrecked. And the paint wasn't real bad, but it had, cra you know, it had cracks in it and stuff, and it was actually originally metal flake blue, a real nice color. But and it would have buffed out enough that it people would have. I really didn't dawn on me that everybody thought that a car with a paint job must be wrecked, you know. I wasn't uh, real up on all the scams that everybody did, I was just 17, I think. And uh, <clears throat> with the place I took it to, they said they sanded them and painted them and everything. They didn't sand it, they sprayed right over it. There was some rust in the back window, and I thought, well, they're going to do it. They're going to do it, so I won't mess with it. You know, it was a little bit around the trim of the back window. They just sprayed over the rust. But the other thing is, when I was trying to pick my color, you know, you're looking at these tabs, and I was like, well, is, I want this original, close to the original color as possible. And I, I said, what about, and they were just like, they were real, you know, like, they were like junkyard guys, you know, in that place. And it was supposed to be a, they advertised on TV to be a good place, but it was more like going to a junkyard. What do you want? What color you want? You saw what color you want? You know, they wouldn't tell me nothing. And and I picked one and I tried to, it was in a low, it was in a room with not enough light and I took it and looked and I said, what is that? Uh, I asked him, you know, is that uh, close to the car? And he says, I don't know. He said, like, I don't know, something like that. So anyway, I picked a color. It turned out to be sky blue, baby blue. It looked, and no, but I didn't like it. Nobody liked it. And plus, they thought everybody thought even people, several people came and looked at it. And uh, and I changed the springs in it. I took the big springs out and put some six cylinder springs in it so that it set straight and everything. Because it was you know, it was like jacked up in the front when I took the 454 out. So um, it looked sharp. I mean, if you like baby blue. But anyway, a foreign guy came and bought it and paid me cash. I think he even paid me what I asked for it. Maybe a little. I maybe he asked me to go down a little bit. But anyway. I did get sell it for like a thousand dollars, I think it was. And uh, before I got to ever work on that 454 and put it in that '67 Chevelle, I decided to run off. I was 18, yeah, I was 18. I decided to run off and get married. Bought that '64 panel truck with that money, and I went went to Cal uh, Colorado, and uh, ended up, and then ended up coming back to Texas and. Then after I had gotten a job, I moved to Wichita Falls and uh, and I had a job up there and got a job up there and uh, that's where I'd used my well I I took that 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 motor to the machine shop and had a magnaflux it and the heads were cracked like crazy not usable all the seat all the valve seats were cr millions of cracks in them uh, all the block let's see did I use that block. Okay, the block was usable, but the the pistons, I destroyed them getting them out. Well, I had done that back at, before. I I'd soaked it for weeks, a couple of weeks in transmission fluid and everything I could think of, and I had destroyed the pistons getting them out. But I still had to crank the rods. The, the, you know, the only thing I couldn't use was the heads. And in the meantime, I, okay, I need heads. And so I always look for a bargain. I found a 62 Impala station wagon with a 396 and got it for like back in those days, you know, I got it for like 200. It smoked, but I didn't care about that because I was going to rebuild the motor. 
<coughs> and uh, but I thought 454s were way better than 396s because <coughs> they listed to have more horsepower. But uh, but I didn't have a book for 62s though, so I really didn't know the exact horsepower of it. Um, so anyway, uh, that was really would have been a good car for my wife to drive. It would have been a great grocery getter. But I went ahead and pulled that motor, and uh, so that gave me another turbo 400. I see that yeah, I had, yeah, I had a turbo 400 from that. I think I still had the turbo 400 from the. Uh, I don't remember now. I don't. I don't think I put the no that turbo 400 wouldn't fit the six cylinder. <coughs> I think I put a power glide in it, two speed <coughs> automatic. So uh, I, sh I should have had two turbo 400s, one on the 396, one for the 454, and the 454 with bad heads, and uh, the 396 with you know worn but good, everything good. So I ended up putting the 396 heads on there. Rebuilding the 454 block, uh, I had machine shop put the rods on the on the pistons, the brand new pistons I bought from J C Penney. Did you know that you used to could buy pistons, car parts like that from J C Penney? You could back then, and that was just where I found the best price. <clears throat> and uh, I've got some that had a little bit of a rise in them. They were. I think there was something maybe like nine to one compression back then. Ten to one was the only thing worth having, you know, <laughs> but uh, they were too expensive. <coughs> uh, so I got, I think it was something like nine, nine and a half to one or something compression. And it ran good. But after, I don't know how long I drove it, a year. I don't remember how many miles. Well, I don't think, well, I guess, yeah, my mileage would have worked on that truck. I didn't have any big tile, tall tires on it or anything. That back in those days, you ran uh, uh, nylon bias tires, <clears throat> but uh, and I hadn't spent any money on any wheels or tires for that. Tr I never did. I actually, never did. Only thing I ever did was end up getting some wider radial tires for it. But uh, oh yeah, I did. I, uh, later on, after I'd already had the 454 in it for a year or two, I bought some white lettered. Tires that were like all-terrain tires. I did do that, but same old steel wheels. They weren't real wide tires. <coughs> Looked a lot better. Anyway, uh, that thing ran good too, and it, it was it was fast for a big old van. I raced this guy I worked with later after I came back a few years, you know, two, well three years late. Uh, I stayed up in Wichita Falls three years, three and a half years. Came back here. Ended up, well, I worked in a cabinet shop for a couple of three years, and then I ended up going to General Dynamics in 79, so I still had it in 79. Sold it in 80, 82, or something like that uh, <clears throat> for money for down payment for some land. I loved that old truck, but I wasn't driving it a lot anymore once. Um, I had the SS Chevelle. See, I had bought that. I got that SS Chevelle for eight, 800 bucks while I still had the I think I bought that before I did the motor swap because I need, you know, before that, that was my daily driver. So, you know, you need two vehicles to be doing all that kind of stuff. So, ended up loving that Chevelle. So, I had two hot rods, you know, a hot rod truck and a hot rod car. And um, so, I didn't drive the, the panel truck as much. But anyway, the it spun a rod bearing. Yeah, that must have been several years later, I guess. Much longer than I'm thinking because... I was back here, and, well, I, that was after I did mess up the uh, frame in the Chevelle up in Wichita, but I still drove it for years, several years. I just remember I was back here, I think I lived out in the country with the land I bought, and I came back, and I didn't have no pavement or anything to work or a garage out there, just my mobile home in my land, with a creek on the back and solid trees, I loved it. Lived there for nine years, <coughs> but uh, I, br I brought the, uh, the Chevelle over here to my mom's house. She had a really flat driveway and a shade tree, perfect. And uh, the Chevelle, I brought. I guess I had, we had my wife drive one of them. I brought the Chevelle and the '64 panel truck, put them both in the driveway, and I worked on it from Friday night till Sunday night at like ten, about ten, th about eleven, eleven thirty at night. I had to go to work Monday, and uh, Pulled two motors and, and put this and put both of the motors 
and then uh, <clears throat> I got, I guess the, van, the the truck was still running, it was just knocking real bad, you know, so, I, so yeah, and I put all the parts in her garage, she didn't like that, and uh, I put the 402 big block, well, of course, the 454 is a big block, but I put the 402 out of the 70 SU Seville in the, bla in the, not blazer, in the 64 panel truck, finally got it all back, oh, and it was 30 degrees all weekend, and it snowed on me Sunday night while I was, for hours while I was working. But it, here, you know, it was like, people would laugh and say, you call that snow, but it was snow, and it was beginning to collect up in the grass, too. And I was so tired by that time. I remember it was around 10.30, I had it all back together, and it wouldn't go anywhere. It was running, everything was running, but it wouldn't go anywhere, and it, and I just could not, I could not figure it out. and. Across the street, an old man, an old fellow, Mr. Edwards, he was a mechanic all his life, and he was he was still running his garage back then. <clears throat> and I had gone to his garage to get inspection a couple times and stuff, but I always worked on my own stuff. I never took my vehicles to garages back in those days. And uh, <clears throat> he came out and hollered at me for making noise because I had glass packs on it. And I said, well, I said, I'd seen him looking out at me, you know, come out looking at me, but he never said anything. Once he hollered at me, I was so mad at must, everything at the world by that time. I said, well, instead of just standing there looking at me, why don't you tell me what the heck's wrong with this thing? I know you know. <laughs> and then he kind of, and, and he didn't get mad. He, got, he kind of toned down a little bit, and he came over and said, well, what's happening? And he says, well, you probably don't have your, did you get your, you have to get your, uh, when you install an automatic transmission, you have to get your, uh, Make sure you get it turned just right so that the the, uh, the torque converter, it's got these two slots that have to go over what is the the pump for the transmission. And they, a lot of times they'll hit like that. And it's not they're not that long, they're only about an inch or so deep. So what had happened, and I realized it once he told me, I knew this, I just was so tired I wasn't thinking straight anymore after that long weekend. Um, I knew I had trouble getting the torque converter to meet up with the flywheel, <clears throat> which people call a flex plate nowadays, but we called automatic and standard flywheels. We called them flywheels back in those days. And uh, anyway, I had had a hard time getting it to meet up, and so I knew he was right. And so I had to, all I had to end up doing was loosen three or four bolts and then twist that torque converter, and then it went chunk and went into the pump hooked it all back up, and I was ready to go. So he saved me. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> and I did thank him very much once that worked. I mean, he didn't stay out there the rest of the time. Uh, I guess I told him later. But anyway, uh, he might have looked out once I got it going or something. So... Uh, I had that motor in there. By that time, I had raced the heck out, you know, street raced the heck out of it, and we're usually, usually racing myself almost all the time. Uh, by that time, it was beginning to, you know, foul plugs a little bit on a couple of cylinders, but I drove it for several more years until I bought my own. Yeah, I didn't own the land yet at that time, I guess. Where did I live? Now I don't remember how I did what. Oh, yeah. That's right, I had the 454 in it when I bought the land and then I put the 402 in it. See, I, I'm pretty sure I lived down in, in the land. So anyway, uh, now, why am I trying to tell this? Yeah, when I, I do know one thing. When I, I sold the truck for 900 bucks, which was actually less than what I could have probably got for it, by two to four, 500 more dollars less than I could have got for it, uh, but I was trying to hurry up and get some, I just, I needed, you know, I needed uh, that money to pay my down payment on the land. I wanted that land real bad. So, um, yeah, and I had a, I had not long before that, I had bought a brand new motorcycle on a payment plan, Yamaha 400, a street bike. And I thought I'd be driving it to work. And then another guy wanted, wanted to ride with me and pay me and I ended up, picking him up and taking him to work, keeping on driving the panel truck, I guess is what I was driving. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> end up selling the Chevelle body real cheap later. And uh, so get, you, get your wheels, 
and get you a low profile tire and if you can get a nylon tire put your inner tube in it and then put your big old mud tires on top so even yeah those big old 48 45 48 inch tires be even, might even be uh, easier to get on there and then uh, if you want to run them on lower pressure you could if you think that's better or but uh, for grabbing you know um, <clears throat> if you're if you're going to drive if all you're doing is rock hauling, that's one thing. But if you're going to drive hard and fast like I always did, then you want some air in those tires. You really want is the max of that that's you know that they're rated for. Because uh, when you hit things hard, you don't want that tire to completely collapse. But of course, even if you've got this, I'm sure there'll be many problems with my idea, but I think it could probably work as long as you can get your other tire over that other one. But then you would uh, even you might not even have half as much height. But even if you had a third as much height, you could still drive for miles and miles. You know, if you're stuck, and if you were off road, then it would just be like airing down really far. You know. But I'm fidgeting because I got to have a break. So I can't believe I talked this long, just fiddling around, doing this. But I'm gonna have to go. So.